Let's pray. Oh Lord, we do rejoice in you, our Redeemer. Here specifically, as we come together to celebrate the Lord's table communion, I pray, Jesus, that you would be made much of and that we would just love you even more. And it's always in your great name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. And as we do, some men are going to come forward with Bibles. And so if you don't have one, we want a copy of God's word in everybody's hand, either looking at it, turning to it. So if you don't have one, go ahead and raise your hand and these men will distribute one to you. And if you don't own one, you can go ahead and take that and keep it as a gift. So again, that's Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. This is the time in our service when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. This is a time for us to remember corporately the death of Jesus, specifically the death at the cross, and to proclaim his death until he returns. And we do this by taking a, a piece of bread, and we do it by taking a cup. The bread represents his body that was given, and the cup represents his blood that was shed at the cross. Please follow along as I read Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. Therefore, the slave fell to the ground and was prostrating himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And feeling compassion, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii and said to him and seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So, that his, so his fellow slave fell to the ground and was pleading with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Thus, or then summoning him, the Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your hearts. Peter is asking Jesus about forgiveness of sin. Someone sins against him, how often should he forgive him? He's trying to quantify it. When can I stop forgiving my brother? Is this not sometimes what happens in our heart? When can I stop forgiving this person who constantly is continuing to sin against me? And Jesus quickly responds, explaining, there is no specific number. You keep on forgiving. And then Jesus tells Peter a parable to provide an aspect of forgiveness that Peter is missing. The point of this parable is that we can mercifully forgive our brother because we've mercifully been forgiven. And what we forgive others is nothing in comparison to the magnitude of what we've been forgiven. So this morning, as we take the Lord's Supper, I want us to consider what we've been forgiven. In this parable, the wicked slave owed the king 10,000 talents. A talent was worth more than 15 years of a laborer's wage. So this slave owed the king more than 150,000 years of a laborer's annual income. 
That's a couple thousand lifetimes of earnings. That's just not a big number. It's ridiculous. It's insurmountable. It's unpayable. Jesus provided an example that was so outrageous that no one could think that they could possibly pay that back in a lifetime. And then the king in this parable did something astonishing. He canceled the debt. It was all forgiven. It was all completely wiped out. This parable is helpful for considering the magnitude of what believers have been forgiven. It's not so much that there's a number, but it's such an outrageous number that it's impossible to rationally consider repayment of the debt within one's lifetime. Every one of us owes God a debt because we have violated his law, his commands. And we didn't just do this once. We did it over and over and over. Our debt grows and grows and grows. We all continue to sin. We all continue to sin and miss the mark of God's holy and righteous commandments. None of us does everything we ought to do. And we often do the things that we shouldn't do. Whether it's in word or deed or thought, we miss the mark every single day, many times throughout the day. And every time that we do, there's more debt that is added to our account. And there's a day coming when God will settle all the accounts for every single person, for every single person. And there are only two categories of people. Those that have had their debt canceled and forgiven and those that haven't. And the good news is that Jesus offers forgiveness for all those that place their hope and trust in him and what he accomplished at the cross. At the cross, Jesus absorbed the wrath of God for all the sins of all believers for all time. He went in their place. He was their substitute. And because of that, believers are forgiven. Their debt has been paid in full. But for those that haven't put their trust in Jesus for the satisfaction and forgiveness of their sin, of their debt, they will spend eternity in the lake of fire as penalty for having sinned against the holy God. The Lord's Supper is only for believers. It's for those that have put their hope and trust in Christ. So if you're here this morning and by your own admission would say you don't fall into that category, you have not put your hope and trust in Christ, then when the tray comes by, we simply ask that you would just pass it by. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you get to hear these truths. And we would love to talk to you about what it means to put your hope and trust in Christ. Talk to me, any one of the other pastors, the person that brought you. Do not put that off until tomorrow, for we do not know what tomorrow holds. Believer, you are a sinner. And you have accumulated an insurmountable, incomprehensible debt because of your sin. And you have been forgiven. Your debt was paid in full. And the currency was the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed at the cross. Thinking about the magnitude of our sin that was forgiven at the cross should cause us to be in awe of the magnitude of mercy that was shown us by Jesus who suffered and died in our place. When your heart is prepared, go ahead and take communion on your own and I'll come back up and close our time in prayer.